The first time I came to Virtual Futures was the first time there was a Virtual Futures. Uh, I met Eric and Joan at the ICA. I was doing an event there. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd come over actually to talk at uh, Trinity College w in Dublin with, with Ian Banks, and I was going to do a, a book tour, and someone had penciled me in at the last minute for this event at the ICA. And, uh, and the, we're talking about virtual reality, because I wrote about virtual reality all the time. I was just, you know, you couldn't drag me out of there. And, uh, but I'd never actually been in a virtual reality other than the one between my ears. So they took me into another room where they were running a virtual reality program. And there's a long line of people who'd been waiting very patiently, but they let me jump the queue. And I put on, you know, goggles, and I was in this little cartoony uh, environment where uh, I was supposed to ski, but I was so busy trying to catch the virtual reality out by, you know, looking in unexpected places. And uh, so I wasn't very, wasn't a very good skier. Um, but uh, that was okay because it was, you know, it was really exciting. It was like being in Mario Brothers. You know. um, that was in 1994. My son was eight. Um, his father and I were in the process of getting divorced. Uh, my novel, uh, Fools, had just come out. It was two years late, but, you know, that's one of those things. And uh, it, they were late. I wasn't late. I was right on time. Uh, and uh, I, I was actually looking forward to a rather uncertain future when I got invited to Virtual Futures. And it was the first time that I had met other people who were thinking about what I was thinking about who weren't science fiction writers, who were actually concerned with things in the real world because that was their job. And, uh, and that was very exciting to me. And I, I met academics, and I met other writers, and I met filmmakers and musicians, and I met people I don't know how to describe. Manuel de Landa, Stellark. And uh, the, it was a wonderful weekend, and everything went great until it was my turn to speak. Now, Stellark and I were the very last speakers of the entire weekend. And the lineup was supposed to be me and then Stellark, which I thought was a good arrangement. But at the last minute, they asked me to switch because they said Stellark had to leave. And, um, and so I, I, was, I wanted to be a good guy. So I, I said, well, OK, what am I going to do? You know, hold up Stellark? You know, it's like, well, he has been held up by experts. But um, so we, he showed us a video. And it was the endoscopic sculpture. Now, you only saw about three seconds of it. I saw, like, a year of it. <laughs> now, and I, I am of a delicate sensibility, I have to admit. But also, at that time, it was about three weeks earlier, I'd been in the hospital, and I'd almost died from a, from a strep infection that suddenly blown up in my thumb. And it had turned my thumb into something way more bizarre than anything Stellar had showed us, but I was still feeling a bit delicate. Still, it was, it was a wonderful presentation, and you know the Stellar laugh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, evil. Evil, but, you know, in the nicest possible way. <laughs> and uh, so it was, you know, it was great, and then I had to follow that. And uh, Sadie Plant introduced me by saying, and now the only person who could possibly follow that, Pat Cadigan. I died. <laughs> you know, I had a prepared speech. I could barely read it. I think I made a few jokes about not even having a mammogram to show anyone, and I sat down while I was behind. Now today, at the last minute, I have arranged some visuals, because I never have before. And uh, it's, you know, at the last minute, so it's kind of in keeping with my usual routine. And uh, the, the first two images that you'll see aren't mine. Those are the only two that I haven't taken myself. And uh, they illustrate a new syndrome that has lately been identified called 
FOMO, fear of missing out. They say that this is an anxiety that's become particularly acute thanks to social networking. You know, you check your friend's status, she's at a party. Now, you're not. <laughs> now, it's only a short step from FOMO to paranoia, albeit a rather hinky sort. You're afraid people aren't talking about you. They're not plotting against you, and you're not Madonna or Paris Hilton. Of course, regular paranoia works too. This is actually a postcard that was sent into Post Secret. I just love this. But you know, it's one of those thoughts. What has been thought cannot be unthunk. I can't look at a store window without thinking that. So, um, you know, there's a rule that says if it exists, there's porn of it. Well, there's another rule. If it exists, someone is real neurotic about it. Now, if you're a compulsive status updater, somebody should tell you about pleaseburgleme.com. You know, I think that explains itself. You know, come on. It's like basic, come on now the rain type of thing. You know, it's common sense. Do what your mother told you. She's probably right. You know, most mothers are. Most mothers are right about everything they told you. I'm sorry, it's Father's Day. I don't care. <laughs> My mother was mother and father to me. And I used to tell her to go screw herself, but only under my breath where she couldn't hear me. Um, no, it's, most mothers are right. Now, there, there are some notable exceptions. You know, Galileo's mother, she was way off, you know. Can you hear it in their house? And I suppose you're right, and the whole world is wrong. <laughs> but in general, your mother's right. Anyway, the rest of these photos I did take myself, and they might have some connection to what I'm talking to, or they might not. I call this one the proofreader's last day. That's uh, a, couple of, a couple of months ago in, I think, the Indy. The independent. Well, no one was more surprised than I was when Virtual Futures invited me back in 1995. I was so happy, though, because I'd kept in touch with everybody, and I was reading all their books, and I was getting all kinds of great ideas, and, and you know, I, I got ideas I didn't even know I'd had. I didn't know I could get ideas like this. And Virtual Futures 1995 was an immense monster made of chaos in mostly a good way but you know it's like you turn up and things were either running an hour behind or an hour ahead or you know or it was hard to find them or but you know people were enthusiastic they didn't let that you know stop them from doing anything um, virtual futures 1996 was uh, uh, the last one and it, that happened just a few days before Chris and I got married. And it was a few months before I packed up my son, my mother, my cat, and my various goods and chattels and moved them all from Overland Park, Kansas to Herringay, North London. I had a head full of ideas about the future. It was always the near future. That, that's, my, that's my thing that I do. I've, I always like to see how close I could get and still get it right ahead of the state of the art. You know, and I still like to do this. It's risky. Uh, my first novel, I had to make changes in galleys because uh, something happened with lucid dreaming a couple of decades sooner than I thought it would. But that's, you know, that's always the way it is, and not just for me. So what happened to the future? That's actually the, the, the title of this talk. It's something like, what happened to my future and is it too late to find the right one? Now, I know Richard Barbrook has told you that the future is what, you know, it's always been. Now you know this way out, in Finnish. And, oh yes, that's, that's an article about me in, in, in the Helsinki journal. I don't know what it's called. I forget, and I couldn't pronounce it. 
But, um, and when I took this picture, I took this picture, so, you know, to send it to my mother. And when I took this picture, on the little screen it said, blink detected. It still bothers me. That was the, um, in the previous picture, they, they, they took my picture against that and it made me look very arty. So, um, Richard told us that the future is always what it used to be. What Richard hasn't mentioned is that when it comes to determining, determining what that is, the future is the elephant and we are the blind men and women trying to determine its actual dimensions. It's very like a rope. It's very like a snake. It's very like a tree. It's very like a tent, you know. And while you might have hold of the trunk today, tomorrow you may have the foot or the tail or something worse. What happened to our future seems to parallel, I mean, in, in my thinking, of course, and because it's all about me, um, parallel what happened when my second novel, Sinners, was reprinted in the United States by a new publisher. The publisher loved the book, and the editor commissioned a Neil Gaiman introduction for it. Now, that may seem, we may seem like the odd couple, but Neil Gaiman happened to be one of the judges for the Clark Award the year that Sinners won. So I thought it was very nice, you know, and, and Neil and I have the same uh, agent, so, uh, so I could actually, you know, get him to return her phone call. And, uh, but he was nice, he, he did a, a really nice introduction. They did a, a beautiful cover. There, there are two people here who have actually copies of that particular edition. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. I was happy, my agent was happy, the publisher was happy, and the book came out on the 9th of September, 2001. My birthday's the next day, by the way. That is what happened to our future. I should have expected this. I mean, this is what I've always written about, when all the bright, shiny technology fails to work properly, or it fails to work at all, or if it works, it doesn't make everything all better. But 2001 was supposed to be a landmark year. I mean, no, it was a landmark year. It was supposed to be the anti-1984. It wasn't a year where terrorists enacted an elaborate plan to fly commercial jets into skyscrapers. That wasn't the future. You know, we were still pissing and moaning about, you know, we didn't have our flying car and there was no monolith on the moon where we weren't taking our vacations, by the way. You know, and there wasn't a manned uh, uh, mission to Jupiter. We weren't going to have an acid trip, and, you know, in the, uh, in the red spot. And, uh, and we'd been promised things like that at the 1964 World's Fair and the Jetsons and, you know, lots of other things. Yeah, you know, I was there at the 1964 World's Fair, and I remember dragging my mother into all of the most futuristic exhibits. And there was one where, I don't know how they did this, but they went like to every child everywhere else in the world and got their name and address and what they were interested in. And then they brought all that information, which sometimes doesn't work, um, they brought all that information to the World's Fair and they matched kids up. So, you know, within a, a, a range of, of ages, I think it was like 12 to 17. I was a little bit young, but I was 12 for my age, so I got in. And, uh, and I was matched up with a girl from Helsinki and a girl from Uganda. And uh, I, uh, I was in touch with, the, with Marketa in Helsinki until I went off to college and she got married and we kind of lost touch. But the Ugandan girl, we, were, we exchanged like maybe three letters and then war started and I never heard from her again. And that, that, was, that was what keeps happening to us, you know. Our future is supposed to be, yeah, we get something really nice and we do that for a while and then we go on to something else, you know, we make progress. But more often, um, it's like uh, you barely get started and then everything blows up. 
you know, I, I saw this, this was a, uh, this is in Lest Square Tube Station. And uh, whenever I've had a crash with my computer, I, I, I look at this and I think, at least I'm not that guy. <laughs> the guy who had to see that on his screen, you know, at 4 p.m., you know, on a weekday afternoon in Leicester Square. Anyway, um, as far as I know, no one else has mentioned 9-11 yet. Or maybe I'm wrong and, and I just missed it, but I think most of you student types were still in elementary school when that happened. And I really hope that you never cursed with, with an event like that in, in your adult lives. It's the, the karmagram that says, everything you know is wrong, everything you thought you were going to know is wrong, and everything you used to know is now something else. The surveillance society that we were still objecting to as a concept in 1994 is business as usual now. You know, the intrusions into privacy well, actually, we'd already given up quite a lot of privacy for the sake of convenience. You know, someone mentioned the implants with your medical records yesterday. Well, in the U.S., people were already having their kids chipped like dogs. Well, not exactly. They'd wait for the permanent molars to come in, and they'd have the dentist put in, you know, I don't know, a microdot or something. And then there were people in New York City who were having implants put in their arms, so they could get into the VIP area at the exclusive club. You know, I, I love that. That's so classically cyberpunk. Yeah, no, it's set passe now. It's New York. But 9-11 changed the world forever in every way. And we live firmly in the surveillance society, and we're not going back. Now, the surveillance society isn't all bad. In fact, a lot of it's very entertaining. Or at least the programming directors of various TV networks want us to believe that it is. But you know, all that surveillance hardware and software doesn't pay for itself, and program directors can shell out a lot of money for all that caught on tape video because they don't have to pay writers or actors or costumers or set designers or anyone with a union that protects their interests and guarantees a decent wage. We were all so afraid of ending up in 1984 forever. Big Brother. Big Brother is a fucking game show. <laughs> the sound you hear is George Orwell spinning in his grave yelling, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, rolling on the floor, laughing my ass off. I can has reality. I wrote you a paper, but I edited it. I'm oh, sorry. Without I can has cheeseburger.com, my life would be unlivable. <laughs> this also happens to be why I don't feel compelled to check my email every 10 seconds, because I know what's in it. A lot of funny cat photos and occasionally some penis enlargement spam that slipped through the filter. <laughs> I don't know why I keep getting that stuff. Everybody knows I've got a monster dick. <laughs> but I guess many people are just not so blessed. The Surveillance Society has triggered everyone's OCD to a certain extent. I'm sure some of you are so bad that it's actually CDO. That's OCD with the letters in the right order. But I don't have it. I really don't. I don't have to check my email all the time. Why? Because I am the laziest assed person you ever met. No wasted movement, that's my motto. Also, I'm contrary. Tell me I gotta do it, and that's the last time you'll see me. Just ask my mother or my ex-husbands. But Pat, you say, we can't help noticing that you seem to be surgically attached to that iPad. Yes, I am. A couple of years ago, this would have been a notebook, you know, with paper for like pens and pencils. It would be rubber banded to a book. And I've been like that forever. I was the only kid in the neighborhood who would go out to play and take a book in case it got boring. Or if I were working on a novel, as I was often in those days, 
even when my, my age was in single digits, um, I'd take a notebook with me. And I actually started doing that because my mother would make me take something with me because she knew that I was sitting on like curbs or steps and she didn't want the seat of my pants to wear out or get dirty. So I had to, you know, take something to sit down on. It made sense then. It didn't sound quite so bizarre as it does now. But uh, Surveillance Society has a few natural companions. I've mentioned FOMO. And another is outsourcing. Outsourcing is why when you phone your local bank, you end up talking to someone in Bangalore. But hey, it's the web. It's like everybody's right next door, right? No. Now, in case, in case you needed that question answered, no, it isn't. The first and last time that I ever flew United Airlines round trip to the States from here, um, I was coming home from Denver, and I had to check myself in. Now, self-check-in in America is not like it is here, much like healthcare, which I'll get into. Um, self-check-in in America is they throw you to the wolves, and, uh, and you try and check in. And there, so there's a little thing where you put your, you know, your, your passport onto the barcode reader, and uh, if the screen says problem or cannot read, call for help, there's a, there's a convenient phone receiver. You pick it up and you call for help. So I had to do that, of course. And I'm talking to the guy on the other end, and I describe the, you know, the error code or whatever it is, and he says, oh, you know, he can't help me. I have to go to the help desk. And I said, well, where is the help desk? And he doesn't know. Why? Because the help desk is in Denver with me, and he's in the fucking Philippines. He's never seen the Denver airport. I don't know why not. I call the one guy on the job who isn't surfing the web and looking at webcams. I heard on the news that a city, was it Manchester or Birmingham, that outsourced some of their city jobs? I, am, did I dream this? Birmingham. 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 You know, way to go Birmingham, because they want to save money. You know, it's like, if you don't invest in the people that you have around you, that's a very false economy. I bet one of the outsourced jobs is sending out the overdue bills on council tax, which people can't pay because they don't have jobs here. They're on the other side of the world. I think every city employee in Birmingham should get up and move to India. They should outsource the employers. See how they like it. Self-check-in. I say save someone's job and don't use it. Don't give the bastards an excuse to outsource. I don't use a self-checkout at the grocery store either. I mean, are you kidding? Do I have to tell you what happens when I use it? There is an unexpected item in the bagging area. Please remove it. Of course, it's the item that I just scanned. It's supposed to be there. But no, it is an unexpected item in the bagging area. Please remove it. The whole store is staring at me. Half the people are furious because I'm too stupid to use self-checkout. The other half are really embarrassed for me and also really glad that it's not them. <laughs> and there's one old stoner hanging out thinking, wow, unexpected item. This ass is great. <laughs> yeah, drug, drugs are better than ever. Oh, and everything is okay. Just so you know, I saw this guy standing on a stepladder in Covent Garden <laughs> and holding the sign. And I said, are you sure? And he said, no, I'm Danny. <laughs> I was going to tell him that nobody loves a smart ass, but it was too good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of those things that pop up at you at the street, you know, and you think, yeah, me too. Drugs are better than ever, though. They really are. And I only know this because I live here in the UK. In the US, I cannot afford them. 
Now, I had emergency surgery on a weekend in the United States without health insurance. And I'm not making this up. It was, it was emergency gallbladder surgery, but it was laparoscopic. So they didn't have to, you know, saw into the body cavity. They, I've seen, I've seen a, a film of how they do this. And, you know, it's like, oh, how could you do that to my abs? All those sit-ups. But, um, so, it, and I went home the next day. But the bill for that weekend that I spent with, you know, the gallbladder surgeon was more than my divorce. And my divorce lasted for two years and included a custody fight. I'm not making this up. That's, you know, the real inconvenient truth about U.S. health care is if you can't afford it, you die. And just so you know, health insurance isn't that great either. When I was, uh, when I was still working outside the home, I had a health insurance plan where they would pay part of my bills, but only as much as they thought they should cost. So if I went to a doctor and the bill was $150, the health insurance company would say, that's outrageous. It should only be $50. Here's $25. So even people who have health insurance aren't very happy. It hasn't always been that way, you know, but that's a story for another time. The good news is the drugs work. They really do. But as always, there's something a little wonky there. And we talked about medicine here, health care. I, I, I have witnessed something unbelievable. Stellark getting free plastic surgery in the United States. <laughs> My friends aren't going to believe this. I'm going to call his surgeons. And maybe they'll give me a tummy tuck if I agree to put an ear on my navel. <laughs> we talked about lifestyle drugs like Viagra or Viagra and Allie, the obesity thing. Yes, obesity has been mentioned. I used to be thin. You're giving me that look. You're thinking, you could be thin again if you didn't eat so much. Actually, I don't eat so much. I was thin until I got sick, or as you say it here, became ill and had to take drugs. And as many people, possibly a few others here besides me can tell you, weight gain is an unfortunate side effect of a lot of drugs. You know, I'll give you a for instance, you're thinking. Actually, I can't hear you thinking. I can hear you tweeting. That's right. I don't even have to switch over to Twitbird to know about the snarky remarks. Yeah, you know who you are. I do too. Yeah. Man, here's, the, here's the, the, the future of the spoken word. They don't heckle you anymore because there's a bigger audience on Twitter. People can talk behind your back and look right at you. You know, who saw that future coming? But I digress. Where was I? Right, I'm fat because of the drugs I take. Now, it's gonna give you a for instance, okay. Among the many drugs that will make you fat, the most common are probably antidepressants. Look at the package insert. You'll see that common side effects may include, but are not limited to, any or all of, among a long list, drowsiness, poor appetite, and weight gain. Poor appetite and weight gain. <laughs> they made a drug that will reduce your appetite and cause you to gain weight, and they give it to you because you're feeling suicidal. <laughs> Rachel? Rachel Armstrong? Help me. <laughs> They've got it backwards. Get them to, to, to make the drug where it increases your appetite and you lose weight. You won't even have to put in the antidepressant. Allie, the Xenocol, I'm acquainted with that as well, to my everlasting regret. People are lining up to take it until they find out what it does to them, and then they're lining up for the bathroom. And that shit's expensive, literally. <laughs> I quit taking it. 
I was spending all the rest of my disposable income on adult diapers. And I wouldn't have minded, except they made me look fat. <laughs> Viagra works great, though, for men. Here I am, no appetite, Rubenesque, even without the adult diapers. I'd be in the mood if I weren't so drowsy. Oh, too much information? Are you serious? I know what you people browse. I've sat behind you. <laughs> too much information, please. I've heard that people think that Prozac and, and things like it are overprescribed. Antidepressants are overprescribed. And I don't think that we should buy into that. You step back for a second and think. If you live in a society where a sizable portion, not most, but a sizable portion of people are taking drugs so they won't spend most of the day weeping uncontrollably, doesn't that sound like there's something wrong with the society? Mm. Why is nobody asking that question? You know, it's like they have to drug kids to keep them keep them from getting distracted in school. They're kids, you know? It's like they, they, they sent my, my kid home from America, and they said, we think, we think Ritalin would help him with his you know, attention. He's got a short attention span. I said, he's a kid. You can't cure childhood. It cures itself. If he didn't have a short attention span, if he were focused on one thing all the time, you'd be sending me home a note saying, you better have him tested for autism. And another thing, why is there an auto industry? We live in a society that doesn't need any more cars. Really. And yet, you know, we're pressured to buy cars, and then we're made to feel guilty about the carbon footprint we leave when we drive them. You can't make this shit up. You know, it's like if I if I put that into one of my books, you know, as a circumstance for a civilization, my editor wouldn't go along with it. She said, these people are too stupid to live. <laughs> yeah, but, and here we are. Well, maybe we are too stupid to live. We're just slowly finding that out. And another observation while I'm at it, and, and this is just by the way, oh, that's Neil Gaiman in Soft Focus. Naked people, somebody say boobies. Oh, they've tweeted it, never mind. Um, this, was, this was the World Naked Bike Ride Day in London. I love living in London. You have to ask me why, you'll never know. Um, another observation, just by the way. People who say money can't buy happiness just don't know where to shop. I just throw that thought out for you. Now, in certain kinds of jobs, you know, usually corporate jobs, occasionally in politics, you'll be asked where you see yourself in five years or 10 years. And that question is way too small. What do you think the world will look like in five years, or in 10 years, or in 15 years, or 17, which was when the first virtual futures took place in 1994? 17 years is a lifetime. And life is complex. Too often, we make the mistake of trying to foresee the future in a straight line and in dimensions that are too small. The lasting effects of 9-11 are not confined to the airline industry or just the travel industry, because like all industries, these don't exist in a vacuum, under a bell jar, or in isolation. The vast majority of us want to do something, but we're actually in no position to, to do a whole lot at once. We want to do something. We can barely get the people who can do something to do something. But we have the web. So what can we do with the web? Well, someone mentioned, you know, the Middle East. If you're keeping up what happened in, in, in Egypt and in Libya. You know, in 1989, one month before the Berlin Wall came down, I was talking to a group of computer scientists. I was on a panel discussion that included Walter John Williams and Louis Shiner and Bruce Sterling and Tom Maddox and Bill Gibson. 
And uh, this is on videotape somewhere. One of the, the, some of the scientists in the audience start talking about using the internet to subvert dictatorships. And most of the writers laughed at that because that was also the summer of Tiananmen Square. And so they said, well, they'll just send in the tanks and roll over everybody, don't be ridiculous. But I was listening because I thought I heard something un in, underneath what the questions they were asking. They were talking like people who knew something. And six weeks later, the Berlin Wall was down. People were dancing on top of it. Now, I don't know if they actually did know something, but it sure sounded that way. And the Berlin Wall, you know, came down, people poured through from East Berlin, and they bought toilet paper and Madonna CDs. And then, to the great surprise of the East German government, they went home. They took their toilet paper and Madonna CDs and they went home. The East German government thought, well, we'll never see those people again. But they went home because, you know, it was their home. So, um, and now, of course, we have a reunified Germany. And uh, so the future develops. And it's often counterintuitive. Uh, cell phones, for example. You will find almost no science fiction novels, uh, uh, and particularly sci cyberpunk novels, with, uh, with, with a future that, where people have cell phones. And this is because in the States, people had cordless phones for a while with their landlines, and then they found out that their conversations could be picked up on any shortwave radio. So that everyone got really paranoid and threw out their, their cordless phones. And I thought, well, if they don't want cordless phones, they won't use cell phones. <coughs> I've got two. My mother's only got the number for one, though. Um, and I remember also when cell phones started to become ubiquitous, one of the ads that I would see on TV in the States would be, now you can work and drive your car. <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm not kidding. They had this, this, you know, this, this film of there would be a doctor behind his desk and a businessman, and they'd be driving down the street, only they'd have a desk instead of a car, and they'd be on the phone. You know, it's like <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow, that's asking for an accident. And now it's, you know, of course, it's illegal. Um, there was, at IBM was, had these very forward-looking, I think it was IBM had these forward-looking commercials about how You'll send a fax from the beach, and they showed somebody, you know, writing on what may have been, you know, a proto tablet, and then pressing send, and then they put it down, and they walk off up the beach to um, dig clams or something, and uh, they'd say, "Well, you will." And I thought, "Not me." You know, it's like it, there's got to be some place where they can't get you. You know, it's like not. I work for that guy, not me. So where, where is my future? If you want to think about what you can do, you know, a real thing that you can do, you the individual, ask questions. Look for answers by asking questions. Tweet them. Put them on your Facebook status. Think of more questions to ask. Ask the awkward question. Ask a question you've never asked before, and then try to ask a question that nobody's ever asked before. When someone asked me what I wanted to accomplish at the ICA 17 years ago, I, that's, that's what I said. I said I wanted to ask a question that no one had ever asked before. Some people and institutions or religions or organizations would have you believe that they have all the answers. I've been given a lot of answers, but very few of them go with the questions that I've got. And if you feel the same way, don't settle for the answers that you've been given. Keep asking. Keep asking. Don't ask me who the lady in the green paint is. I can't tell you. Um, that's a naked chauffeur. That's a clothes chauffeur. Let's see. This was the telectroscope, which was... Uh, very clever. It was supposed to be you look in and see people in New York. It was just supposed to like go underground. And, and so people in New York had to get up at like 5 in the morning and wave signs at people in London 
who, you know, at 10 a.m. And uh, if you've ever wondered where the human statues go for lunch, <laughs> now you know. There are free hugs in Covent Garden from time to time. This was a, uh, a demonstration that I happened on, a very ominous looking sign that says, you are smelling death. I think anyone who sees that sign, if it's even if you're not the government, that you should, you, should, you should be nervous. That's my sweetheart in Trafalgar Square. This is, actually this is in Tokyo. This is the Tornado Mart for all your tornado needs. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm from Kansas, so I get a lot of the tornado jokes. I saw a tornado in person. I, I've been there maybe under a year, maybe seven months, and I saw a tornado, and it bounced down and then bounced back up again. And, um, and I didn't know whether to have a heart attack or cry. Uh, but cause, because like so many people, you know, so many kids of my age, I'd been terrified by The Wizard of Oz, you know, that movie. Although I think I may have been one of the very few kids sitting in front of the, the, the TV at the end screaming, Stay in Oz, are you crazy? <laughs> but, you know, nobody listens to me. Um, I wasn't sure whether this was an ad for a movie or a moisturizer or a dating service, but you know, you never are. Uh, this is one of those one of those things that uh, swollen forty times in water, but shrinks to original size when dried. You can find it in uh, one of the market areas in Tokyo. This is my idea of nature. Um, I live in Herringay in North London, where the trees grow up out of the streets the way God intended, and uh, where the occasional snail crosses. And I always use this, I always let the snails cross. I figured this is nature's way of telling me to slow down. This is something called the Strand Beeston, which, was, uh, which someone brought to Trafalgar Square. Children can play with them. And this was the Emperor's Elephant which came from Paris, and for three days, the streets of London were closed, while the elephant, hmm, and this little girl uh, played. And uh, it, it was, th these are puppets. These are very large puppets. And uh, for three days, there were big crowds moving through the streets of London, and nobody was pushing and shoving, and everyone was smiling. It was, um, it was like drugs. That's, uh, oh, and that's in Tokyo. This, uh, this is Seven Sisters in, in, in London. It's one of those karmagrams, you know. It's like sometimes people cry out, you know. I hear you, Elmo. This is Kafka. He's in Prague. Um, this is Salvation, as explained in, in Leicester Square one summer. Uh, it's all there, you know, that, that's it, you know, that's everything. Sin, death, gravity, flight, you know, it all fits together somehow. This is, uh, this is what used to be the Berlin Wall. These are very evil gnomes. I don't like garden gnomes. I don't like them at all. <laughs> we're, we're, we're back in, in East Berlin now. Uh, actually, there is no more East Berlin. We are back at the wall. They called this the Eastern Gallery. You guys probably already know this, but I was fascinated by this. And uh, this is also part of the wall. And uh, uh, eventually, you know, it's like it was a wonderful message, but eventually he had to buy vowels and consonants. Still. And you can't do this, and neither can I, but I saw this guy do this. This is, you know, how low can you go? Apparently not as low as he can. And this, at last, is my cat. She is much, much less impressed with me than any of you are. <laughs> and none of you would impress her either. But I am impressed by, by your forbearance. I am impressed by the organization and the enthusiasm and the, the, the willingness of, of everyone to, to give everybody a great weekend. And, uh, and I, have to, I, I have to thank the, uh, 
the, the gentleman who comes after me because without him, you wouldn't have any silly pictures to look at. And uh, um, yeah, I didn't take my Ritalin. What can I say? Uh, you can't cure childhood and you can't stop it either. It's never too late to have a happy childhood. Um, and thank you for thinking. Thank you for letting me think. Thank you for letting me share my thoughts. I'm done. Thank you.